Thanks very much indeed, uh, Bea, and thanks very much to the Standing Committee and the organisers today for inviting me along to speak about this project. Um, needless to remark, thank you very much for the funding. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about that more specifically in a moment. Um, and it's wonderful to be back here. Um, as we've heard, uh, this is now the third century in a row that the Academy has funded this project. And I am um, very conscious that Matthew Seaver is there. And I was at a book launch uh, just a few days ago uh, of Matthew and Geraldine's excavations at Bobeck, uh, which began just a few years ago. And they were publishing the report. Everything, I'm sure, is neatly in the museum. And here we are 135 years after the excavations at Munya began. And, well, it's in progress, let's put it that way. And it wouldn't be in progress without the support uh, of the bodies that I've mentioned and also some of the individuals here. And it's very nice to see some of the people who have sharpened their trowels at Munyalok, uh, have visited the site and have been involved in various ways as specialists and friends of the site over the years. Um, so this is the site of uh, Munyalok. It's about 400 metres to the southwest of Nobber in North County Meath. Um, and all that remains of the lake of Munyalok is this little lake, this little pool. Um, and this is uh, the deepest part of what would have been a much larger lake that was drained in the 19th century. And it's just beside that uh, lake that we find um, the uh, excavation site here in uh, North County Meath. The Cranogue itself uh, is surrounded by a landscape of ring forts. Um, there are at least, at least 15 within a two kilometer radius of the site. And clearly in the early medieval period and probably before, this was a busy landscape with lots of things happening. Um, it was discovered first in modern times, at least in the late 19th century. And it was then that uh, a grant of 10 pounds was offered by the Academy to Colonel Wood Martin to carry out a season of excavations there. And he reported quite possibly in this very room in 1888. And for some reason then the trail goes cold and the site seems to have been forgotten until 1977 when the landowners, uh, Frank Brady and his family of Cruestown House, discovered uh, what were clearly archaeological objects. Uh, thankfully for them, a uh, local resident of Nobber, uh, George Ogan, uh, was able to come down and confirm, yes, this was a Cranogue site. I myself am not available to excavate it, but I have a young man working with me at Nowth as a supervisor. His name is John Bradley, and he will be available to carry out, which will, uh, a four-week excavation. Surely we won't need more than four weeks to resolve all the questions that remain to be answered. Um, and uh, seeing this photograph on my little screen here and on yours, uh, I'm sure many of us uh, will remember fondly uh, John, not just at Munyalok, but at plenty of events in this building uh, and many of the sites that uh, have been mentioned today, uh, John would have been a great supporter of. Um, so it's nice to be able to remember him as well as the site itself today. So this is a, a, an aerial photograph um, uh, taken by Con Brogan in about 1995 during the one of the excavation seasons. And you can see the little lake just behind uh, the excavation site. During John Bradley's excavations at the site, it was shown that it was a multi-period site. And while it may have seemed to be just a Cranog, an early medieval artificial lake settlement. In fact, beneath those uh, Cranog remains were layer upon layer of prehistoric. Uh, <clears throat> and looking at this image, I can see immediately that one of those is definitely not a, a Neolithic artifact, but Mesolithic, maybe two and a half thousand lithics. And increasingly, as post-excavation research is going on, um, it turns out that there's a Neolithic horizon there as well. Early Bronze Age, a number of houses with quite a remarkable array of imported and locally made objects uh, of metal, uh, jet, amber, glass, uh, bone, stone, etc. But it's probably mostly for the early medieval levels, for the Cranog levels, of which there seem to have been approximately six phases uh, that the site is best known. And that is despite the fact that a final report has yet to be produced. Um, for reasons that I don't fully understand, I have to say, the excavation stopped, although it wasn't finished as such, uh, in 1998. I know that as the assistant director at that time, I understood that we would be going back the following year and hopefully the year after that and after that. Um, but that wasn't to be. And for various reasons, uh, John got involved in other projects and uh, the Munyalok project phase two, as I refer to it, uh, came to an end. 
And of course, John unfortunately passed away uh, prematurely and suddenly in 2014, leaving the archive uh, at Maynooth University, where he had moved from UCD, uh, leaving the excavation report incomplete and indeed the excavation itself uh, incomplete. So what I refer to now, retrospectively, the last five years and probably the next five years is phase three of the Munulock project, Wood Martin, uh, uh, Bradley, and now this current uh, phase three. And what I'd like to do now maybe is just highlight a few of the things that we've been able to do thanks to funding specifically through the Royal Irish Academy and the National Monument Service. Um, we established in 2018 a standing committee uh, representing various bodies, culture, cultural institutions uh, and interested parties, uh, including individuals who would have had expertise in working with other legacy projects or indeed in working on this site. Um, and that steering committee gave us very solid and very helpful advice. Uh, the membership of the committee has changed over the years. Different bodies have been represented. Individuals have obviously stepped down and others have stepped up. And I'm delighted to see members of the panel here. And I thank them very much for their support. We established a, a core team um, and it fell to me or it became my privilege to be the project director, uh, the principal investigator of the project. And um, I am ably supported by Aidan O'Sullivan, by Owen Grogan, by Graham Warren and a team of other people. So this is very much a Maynooth University and a University College Dublin project. Uh, it's led uh, on paper and in many respects by Maynooth University, but we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of our friends and colleagues in UCD. And I think it's entirely appropriate that that connection remains, given that John straddled both universities and that students from both universities spent a lot of time working on the site and uh, on the post-excavation strands of work afterwards. And it's a matter of some pride to me as a, a graduate of UCD and as a, a lecturer in Maynooth that we're able to keep up this, uh, this strand. We were recommended uh, by various members of the steering committee and uh, early funders to carry out a, spo a scoping exercise. What has already been done? What needed to be done? What has been published? What's, uh, what specialist reports have been completed? Where are the gaps uh, in the work that needs to be done? And then what are priorities? Priorities in terms of conservation uh, of certain artifacts. Priorities in terms of revisiting certain uh, research questions, etc. And that is what we did in 2019. And it was on the basis of that report that we established a number of important collaborations, both locally within Meath County Council, because that is where the site is, in Kildare, because Maynooth University is there, uh, but also nationally and indeed internationally, as you'll see here. And those supports, that system, uh, uh, that network that we've created over the last few years has given us uh, great strength in terms of uh, our ability to raise funding, our ability to gather expertise from people in different institutions and indeed in different countries, and it has made it a particularly enjoyable project. And if it wasn't an enjoyable project, it would be very difficult to do, as well as being quite onerous. Maynooth University has been particularly supportive, su providing us with facilities, um, providing some of my time. So some of this is done within the context of my role as a, as a lecturer in the university uh, and supporting undergraduate students, because I think this is an important aspect of it. And Elaine mentioned that as well, the community outreach, the fact that these are research excavations. This always was research. It's about looking to the past and trying to reach out to people in the past, but it's also about modern communities. Those can be communities of farmers or local school children, but also communities of people within the universities, whether it's UCD, Maynooth or others. And we have had undergraduate students who have had no exposure to archaeology other than uh, looking at some of the artifacts in Maynooth, uh, preparing some of the samples to go to specialists and so on. Um, um, you might be aware we don't have a Department of Archaeology in Maynooth. This is done through the auspices of the Department of History uh, with colleagues in uh, anthropology, geography and other departments as well. Um, and so, as you can perhaps see here, we've had a number of people over the years working on six-week summer placements, helping with some of the more menial logistical tasks, uh, writing up lists of finds and preparing things uh, to go on to a next level of research with either internal or external individuals. 
And in that regard, we have, uh, as I mentioned, created a network of contacts, but people have begun to find out about us and about the project. Um, and we have had contacts from universities around the world. We have had students come to us to spend a week, a month, six weeks, and several students come back um, from mostly from Ireland, but also from Britain. And as you can possibly see there, uh, from Belgium, France, um, the US um, and, uh, and England. And because of the facilities that we now have in Maynooth, we're able to facilitate these people uh, and uh, allow them to get their work done while building on the project, um, but also creating a, a collaborative uh, and international connection. Uh, and I'd just like to mention that the facilities that we have in Maynooth uh, have been officially named the John Bradley Room, um, not just because of the Manulock project, but because of uh, John's work with the Urban Survey, the Urban Archaeology Survey, uh, the records of which are also uh, housed in this archive. Um, and again, it's with a certain degree of, of pride that we um, maintain John, John's name associated with these various projects. In relation to funding, um, our primary funder is the Royal Irish Academy with support from the National Monument Service, particularly these two strands of funding, the Archaeology Research Excavation Grant, uh, and in more recent years, the last three years, the Archaeology Legacy Project Grant Scheme. And given what you've heard about the 19th century discovery and the support that the Academy gave that excavation, um, it's hard to think of something that doesn't, uh, that fits better into the category of an archaeological le legacy project of the Academy than this. And so, of course, um, the committee have been extremely supportive, not just financially, but in terms of advice uh, and, su and support and encouragement for the project over the years. Um, but importantly, and I'm not going to delve deeply into the figures here uh, in terms of the funding, but this considerable funding from the Academy and the National Monument Service has enabled us to, one might say, leverage funds from other bodies who see, well, if the Academy and the National Monument support, are supporting this project, then we should as well. Um, Loretta Guinan, as Heritage Officer in Meath County Council, has been absolutely excellent in terms of her personal support and the support of her office with the Heritage Council. Um, we've also more recently had support from Creative Ireland and of course Maynooth University. Um, that was trickier during uh, COVID years 2021. Uh, our funding levels from Maynooth uh, decreased but we're back on track again. Um, and I think it's important to recognise those other perhaps smaller, but in some respects, equally important strands of funding that allow us to do other pieces of work that we couldn't get done, even within the significant support that we get from the Academy and the National Monument Service. So what did we do this year, for instance? Well, we continued our campaign of drawing fines. Sarah Nyland is our project drafts person. Um, and although now based in Finland, uh, Sarah has continued to put together a remarkable portfolio of drawings of these uh, 9,000 objects. Um, this is some new drawing right from the start that hadn't things that hadn't been drawn before and also bringing some drawings that had been done to a high standard but not to a standard of publication up to that standard um, and Sarah therefore has been redrawing digitizing finds drawings as well as digitizing over 300 plans um, site plans as well as um, I was going to say elevations unfortunately we, do, we don't have elevations but we've got section drawings as well um, and that has been an important uh, strand of our work. Lithics analysis, I think, is a good example of our collaboration with UCD uh, and Graham Warren's involvement, especially with the Mesolithic strand of the project. Um, Graham has been able to work with some of his postgraduate and postdoctoral students in analyzing especially the Mesolithic, but also uh, Bronze Age and Neolithic lithics as well. Uh, David Stone, uh, formerly independent but now working with the Discovery Programme, uh, has been looking at the botanical remains, particularly the seed remains, um, from the various phases of, uh, of the excavation. And when my uh, colleagues in Maynooth heard that I was applying for funding for the Munyalok jet, I think they had a different idea about what that funding was for. And they said, oh yeah, archaeology must be where the big money is. I said, yeah. So un unfortunately, in some respects, it was just to pay Paul Stevens to look at the jet or jet-like material and objects. There's something in the region of 70 uh, artifacts, mostly uh, early medieval, but some Bronze Age. And the results of this, uh, which are just trickling in at the moment, um, are, 
are, are fascinating in terms of potential uh, ring manufacturing uh, in the late Bronze Age as well as the early medieval contexts as well. Um, Finbar McCormack in the 1980s and early 90s had carried out a lot of work on the animal bone assemblage, uh, the unworked animal bone. Um, and he remarked then, and I, I don't know if this still holds true, but that this was the largest early medieval animal bone assemblage from Ireland. I, I can't imagine that that still holds true, but Ruth Carden has pick an, picked up uh, on Finbar's work and is, is uh, continuing the analysis on the uh, bone remains from the years after Finbar's work. So that had been left in abeyance uh, and Ruth is working on this. Some really interesting things coming out from the, the very few, very small but well-preserved Mesolithic bones. Uh, unfortunately, no human remains from the Mesolithic, but uh, animal remains. John Nicol has been looking at the leather, uh, both looking at our uh, archeological leather, but also doing uh, replicas for the uh, Nobber Heritage Center, for the George Ogan Heritage Center. So that's a, a separate thing that that John is involved in, but it's been very interesting for, him, for us to see his work based on his knowledge as an expert in looking at ancient leather and the craft of leatherworking, but also then using the crafts that he's learned about and tools that he's interested in to recreate some of the uh, sheaths and pieces of shoes uh, that have come from the early medieval levels at, uh, at Munya. It's a separate strand of funding that Brendan O'Neill in UCD has to the main funding, if you like, for the Manulock project. However, I don't think it's uh, inappropriate to mention his work here. Uh, he, he's looking particularly at the, the metalworking and the evidence, not specifically from the metal itself, but more from the molds and the crucibles and the other uh, objects associated with it. And he's been in touch with John Nicol because I think far too often specialists, uh, probably because of various constraints, financial time and otherwise, you know, can work in silos. Uh, John is interested in the metalworking because the, metal, the work that was done on the leather wasn't done with leather. It was done with tools made of other things. So John, of course, is interested in the bone and interested in the metal. Um, and as it happens, John thinks that most of the pieces of leather that we have from Manulok are related to making aprons and gloves for metalworkers. Um, so they're not mostly shoes and sheaths and, and pou pouches, um, although there are some of those things. There's not a lot of leather working. There is a lot of metal working, uh, and the two things are clearly associated with each other, and indeed the, the bone working as well. In terms of looking at the paleoentomology, particularly uh, from the Mesolithic and early medieval levels, Stephen Davis uh, in Belfield has been doing this. Um, and I'd have to say, while in the 80s and 90s, uh, while the excavation was going ahead, probably the, the, the sampling methods and the retention of samples wasn't ideal. It wasn't what we would do now, what Elaine and other people would do now in 2023. Um, there were different ways of taking samples and of storing samples. So unfortunately, I think possibly opportunities were lost. But we're still able to piece together uh, it's almost like an excavation within an excavation. We're piecing together uh, th the results of the excavations of the 80s and 90s with a view to piecing together that picture of early medieval or Bronze Age or Mesolithic Manulok. And Steve has been really good with his microscope at uh, identifying uh, aspects of landscape uh, and diet and probably climate and climate change through the phases and through the year eras at Manulok, which you don't get to see in many places. Not many places in one particular site have this layer upon layer through 6,000 years of history and archaeology. And so Steve's microscope is, if you like, a little window on the past, a tiny window on the past, uh, that nonetheless is revealing uh, quite a big picture. The charcoal and wood analysis, uh, very little of this had been done before, but thanks to Lorna O'Donnell, uh, we've been able to make great progress uh, with this. The, the, the wood has survived reasonably well, the charcoal has survived very well, and as part of this work, uh, Lorna identified charcoal appropriate for uh, radiocarbon dating. And thanks to a link with uh, Chrono 14 and Queen's University in Belfast and funding from the Academy, uh, two years ago we had a sequence of 33 new radiocarbon dates carried out specifically on charcoal and a couple of pieces of wood. And next year we're uh, hoping to carry out some more radiocarbon dates on bone and some other wood as well. And this 
has provided us a much more rigid context and framework in terms of the chronology for those other specialists to work with. Because now when they come back and they say, we've got this really interesting thing that has come from feature whatever or context whatever, have you got a date for it? Well, sometimes we actually could say, yes, we do. Whereas in the past, we were, based, we were basing our research on a handful of dates, literally just five dates that had, been, um, that had, been, that had come back uh, before this third phase of the project. And so in all of that, we've been building up uh, quite a remarkable picture of uh, the landscape at Manulok, the, uh, the, the, the de development through time, pictures of settlement, craft and activity. And when you start to put it together with the various strands that we have had support from, from Meath County Council or Creative Ireland, we've now got 26 or 27 sub-strands of the project in phase three and what we've decided to do with all of this is to uh, bring it all together because we've realized that waiting probably another five years for a final report would um, be unfair on a lot of the specialists who have done the work um, some of whom are quite early career and this work is important for them to be published and recognized for it but also for the archaeological academic uh, and the wider public as well uh, that this is important for us to get this out. We held an international conference last year in Maynooth in 2022, um, which went very well indeed. Um, it was great to see people together, actually people chatting. It was one of the first conferences that I went to after the pandemic. But one of the things that came out from this is that having the specialists, uh, the experts talk to each other was uh, something that you couldn't replace um, and that was that everybody said look we've got a lot of information here we need to get this out into the public domain and so what we are proposing to do is to publish the first 20 chapters of this report in terms of specialist work uh, on the historical side, work by Adele Vranok. Uh, David Stifter is now looking at the Ogham inscription on an, uh, the early um, uh, antler time, uh, the various strands that I've mentioned to you, and a whole variety of others uh, supported and financed by uh, other bodies in Munilak Studies Volume 1, not very imaginatively named, but um, that's due to come out in later in 2024. Uh, we have now got 17 of the 21 essays in. Uh, we have a lot of work done on the illustrations. Most of that is uh, funded by Meath County Council and Creative Ireland. And um, it's a pretty exciting time, I have to say. So the plan is to have a second international conference next year, um, hopefully to mark the publication, uh, perhaps on the 10th anniversary of John Bradley's passing. Uh, on the 7th of November next year, um, and then have uh, another publication in two years after that, and then a final publication, the final excavation report. In whatever guise that will be, uh, inevitably, undoubtedly, some of that will be published online, but it would be nice to see an old book as well. Archaeologists are interested in things and tangible and material culture, and it would be ni nice to see a book to go on the shelves here. So. That's the way things are shaping up. Just to, in, as by way of explanation, if anybody had seen my title, um, somebody put this photograph on, I think it was Facebook probably, a few years ago. And uh, the always reliable Chris Corlett typed underneath it, one day, Michael, all of this will be yours. And I remember looking at it and thinking, I don't know whether that was very, very funny or very prescient, um, but that was me almost 30 years ago uh, on the excavation. Um, and there's a smile on my face there because I didn't know what was to happen. The water table rose as fast as the rains came down and you were sandwiched between uh, layers of water, as some of you will, uh, will remember. Um, and I think I've heard at least two people in, who are now present say in the past, and I won't name them, but if, do you know, if John Bradley hadn't died, I could kill him because of things that he's left behind. Uh, but he was absolutely fabulous. Uh, he was a, a student person. He was very keen on, on students learning. He would always lend his books. If anybody asked a question, he was so happy to share his knowledge. Um, and it, it, again, it gives me pleasure as a teacher in Maynooth just to think, uh, you know, that John somewhere is, is watching now this progress being made, but students, not just from Maynooth and UCD, but from around the world coming and learning from this, contributing to the bigger pot of knowledge, but actually learning from it as well. Um, and if we have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants like John. Um, thank you very much. These are the top 100 people to thank. There are plenty more, but there's plenty more. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.